Um, so I'm, I'm just thinking about, I, I like the global debt crisis as a kind of uh, structuring vehicle, but I'm not, I'm not sure that this is the first. I, I think it's the third or arguably the fifth. Um, 1873 and 1928, I think, are also, uh, you see, global debt crisis. 1928 is not well understood, but the U.S. is effectively lending around the world roughly a billion a year. Germany says it's not going to, it's not going to be able to pay those debts in 1928, and the bond market seizes up. And this, this leads to uh, you know, pretty, pretty dire consequences in, in Europe. Um, in 1873, likewise, uh, you, there's, a, there's a mortgage boom uh, in Paris, Vienna, and Berlin, those three uh, empires, uh, largely borrowing from the Bank of England. And when uh, the Bank of England rapidly raises the interest rate, um, it's LIBOR, effectively LIBOR, the predecessor to LIBOR. Yeah. In both cases, that goes up rapidly, that's a signal to a kind of global financial meltdown, but it's really all very, very, very much about debt in those two cases. Right. Right. So I wonder, I mean, one of the things, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about leverage, because you haven't spoken much about leverage in, in the context of the, the crisis and this sort of derivative market and Dodd-Frank, you know, more specifically connected to this, to this problem. Right. Well, those are sort of two separate, one observation and then a question, but so the other, um, so the 28, 20, the 29 crisis, crisis of the 30s, has some similarities in that it's global. It also has a very striking similarity, which is it's preceded by a very large, rapidly growing country running massive surpluses and lending to another very large industrial country. So the the, the and U.S. A lot. Right, the U.S. And, oh, right, the U.S. in the 20s was the China of the last 10 years. That is, the U.S. is running massive surpluses and lending to these consuming countries, mostly in Europe, just like China is running good surpluses and lending to the consumers. And it all comes crashing down, of course, in, in, in similar kinds of ways. Um, the, the, the big difference that I see in both those cases is that it was not the world's financial center that experienced the, the, the major indebtedness. I mean, in, in the case of the 1920s, the US and the UK were major lenders. Right? And in the case of 1873, it was, as you say, it was the British who were the principal lenders. Here we have a, a debt crisis where the world's biggest financial market and biggest financial center and biggest economy is the debtor country and is experiencing the debt crisis. And that's one of the reasons I think it's, it's been so all-encompassing and so severe and it makes it, I'm not sure it's more dangerous, but it's dangerous in different ways. You know? And the 1920s in some ways looks like, you know, your typical Latin American debt crisis. If only they had, if only they, it had been possible for them to negotiate out these uh, unpayable debts, we might have avoided the catastrophes of the 1930s. It's hard to imagine doing that in the case of the U.S. since the U.S. is the world's financial center. But I, th I take your point. I think those are very good historical analogies. Leverage. Well, um, I'm not sure this will answer your question, but it's, it's related. Right? So there are a lot of people who would argue that a crucial import, uh, a, that a central, perhaps even dominant role in the cause of the crisis was the combination of financial innovation, development of new highly leveraged financial instruments, and deregulation, that, or in, inadequate regulation. And I certainly think that those play a role. Um, they, the, the financial instruments play a role because one of the characteristics of the new structured finance that developed really in the 90s and into the plots, or whatever that decade is supposed to be called, um, one of the characteristics of that structured finance was that it made it harder and harder for the original lenders to actually identify the quality of the ultimate loans they were making. Um, whether in the case of sovereign loans to, to Greece or in the case of mortgage lending to Spain or mortgage lending to the US. And, and I, I could go into detail about how this is all done, but effectively you have, let's say, German financial institutions who are buying securities, bonds, which incorporate tens of thousands of mortgages all over the US or all over Spain. Right? Um, there's no way they, they were assured by the intermediaries that these were of high quality, but there was absolutely no way that the German pension fund or the Dutch pension fund or the German banks or the Swedish banks could ever have really figured out the quality of the loans they were making. And I think people have come to recognize that that's not a good thing, that you always want the ultimate bar or the ultimate lender to have their own independent information about the ultimate borrower, and that derivatives have their place in modern financial systems, but that when they obscure the, the, the chain between the borrower and the lender, that much, it can cause problems. So that's one thing, and that's certainly true. Um, 
It's also certainly true that if national financial authorities had tried to ensure that the borrowed funds were going to productive purposes, which is, I mean, that, that then we would have had a much different scenario. Probably the U.S. would have borrowed much, much less, and what it borrowed would have been used for higher quality mortgages and lending to the private sector and things like that. That's how develop, you know, when developing countries deal with one of these debt crises, one of the things that they do, typically one of the things that the IMF insists that they do is say, okay, now you know. Now you know that you cannot let just anybody borrow just anything. Now you know that you have to keep track of who's doing the borrowing, what they're using the money for, whether that's going to increase your exports, whether that's going to increase your productivity. The Chileans, probably the most market-oriented government in the entire third world, in the aftermath of that crisis said, we now understand that we have to have a much tighter control over what our private sector is doing. Because if our private sector borrows for all these stupid purposes to build 100 shopping malls that end up being empty, it's going to bankrupt the country. And so they impose very strict capital controls on foreign borrowing. So certainly, a better regulatory response would have been, would have, could have avoided some of these problems. Why do I not think that's as central as some other people do? Well, the first is just observational, which is that there is no relationship between the extent of use of structured credit or regulatory laxity and the crisis. Spain, all plain vanilla mortgage lending. There's no, no structured credit, no debt derivatives, no, there's nothing fancy. Just straight, straight mortgage lending by old style banks, you know, what we would call savings and loans in the US, local, local banks. And they got, they had a bigger housing boom than we did and a bigger crash than we did. Um, Spain also had the tightest financial regulation in the OECD, and it didn't matter. And so, so why does it not matter as much as some people think? For two reasons. The first is looking at the US. If $5 trillion come into the US over the course of six, six or seven years are, and are lent out in the American <coughs> financial system, that inevitably has to reduce the quality of the average loan. Just, I, mean, it's, I always say it's, it's a little bit like when farm prices go up, farmers bring the marginal land into production. When you have twice as much money to lend out, you've already lent to all the most credit-worthy borrowers. You, it, it is just an accounting an observation that your loans are going to be of lower quality. So as more money floods into a country, the loan, the quality of the average loan goes down. And that, that's true everywhere. The second thing is a little more political, which is as money floods into the financial system, the banks start putting major pressures on the, on the regulatory agencies to allow them to lend this money out. And that's what happened in the US. So a lot, the, the most people focus on Glass-Steagall. That's was really not the issue. The most important regulatory decisions were made in 2003 and 2004. And they had to do with allowing the American investment and commercial banks not to carry adequate capital on their subsidiaries who are engaging in a structured finance. So in other words, what's happening is the American banks say, oh my god, we can borrow trillions of dollars, or in the case of individual bank, we can borrow tens of billions of dollars and relend it at high rates and make a lot of money in the US if only the Fed and the SEC allowed us to essentially ignore the, regu the normal regulations. And, and the regulators caved. So to put it in, you know, in, in the kind of terms we would use is that the, the laxity of the regulation is endogenous. As the money floods into the country, the banks essentially put tremendous pressure on the regulators to relax the regulations. Now, if, they could, if the regulators had not responded, if they said no, so then things would have gone differently. But that's why I think the, the primary cause, so to speak, is the capital flow cycle and not the deregulatory. Right. 